What's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Becoming Stronger with Wildebeest. Today I have two very special guests on the show here today. They have their own podcast called It's Just Bodybuilding and I'm talking about Ron Partlow and Dusty Hanshaw. This episode was so much fun recording. Dusty and Ron are hilarious and I just still can't believe that I had this opportunity to have them on my show. I hope you all enjoy this podcast, but before we get into it, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Or as Ron says, bell, subscribe, thumbs up, share, comment. Let's get into the video. I hope you're all ready, so let's get into the interview with Dusty Hanshaw and Ron Parlow. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Becoming Stronger with Wildebeest. Today, I have two very special guests on the show today. To my left, we got Big Ron Partlow, and right below me, we got Dusty Hanshaw coming on the show today. I'm really excited. How are you guys doing? We're doing awesome, man. I was just excited to be here. After a week's delay, you made me work for this. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy I uh, crept on here. I know I was uh, going to sneak on originally, so it's good to be here, Will. I was going to do something a little bit different, but I know that Dusty only has an hour today, but I was going to have it just be me and Dusty, and I was going to surprise you, Dusty, and I was going to have Ron sit backstage until I ask you a question or two, and I was going to say, Dusty, uh, I got a message on Instagram from your ex-girlfriend. Uh, she was talking <laughs> to me, and she wanted to have some words with you, and I was going to bring on Ron. Oh, that could have been frightening. <laughs> I could have been frightening. Uh, thank but, God it would have been Ron saving oh, me again. Uh, like you, it, that's Well, so the good, the good thing about not doing that is that you very well may have given him a heart attack. Just fall right over right like, here. Before the joke could be revealed, he might have just been dead. <laughs> and then we're like, Ugh. now what? Yeah. But on a second thought, I have uh, a better one that we should do. Uh, so I was listening to your podcast the other day, uh, just this past one, and I was kind of curious on one of the topics that you guys were talking about. So I went over to WebMD oh, no. and uh, had a rev up uh, low libido. <laughs> so it does happen to a lot of guys, but only few of them want to talk about it. And I just got to say, you you two are very brave enough uh, talking about it on your podcast. After all, vir virility plays a big role in our concept of manhood. Uh, <laughs> valid. Uh, valid. Lots of men have low sex drive for a lot of reasons, but there are a lot of ways to treat it. Uh, so some of, the some of the things that cause it are uh, physical issues that can cause a libido, uh, low libido include low testosterone, uh, prescription medicines, too little or too much exercise, and alcohol and drug use. Uh, psychological psychological uh, issues can also include depression, stress, or problems in your relationship. Uh, four out of ten men over the age of 45, perfect example right here, uh, have low <laughs> testosterone. <laughs> While testosterone replacement therapy re remains somewhat controversial, it's also a common solution to the problem. Depending on the cause, possible treatments include a healthier lifestyle choice, uh, changing <laughs> to a new medication, testosterone replacement therapy, and counseling. So I don't know if that would help you guys out, but... I, I think Dusty can always use some counseling, like pretty much across the board. Yeah, the mental um, counseling would help yeah. me for sure. <laughs> but the problem is the high libido is what causes me to need counseling. See? Yeah, he's Dusty's. It's high libido is his counseling uh, requirement there. But I feel like I needed a little more knowledge about that, so I went back to the 1952, uh, and I went into here and I saw that says if you want to banish your sex ignorance, uh, do you know the facts of sex, uh, the art of love, sex anatomy, sex hygiene, incompetence, protection against disease, diet for sex power, exercises for virility birth control, bad habits, excessive abuse, courtship, and martial arts compatibility. Well, there are five different types of books that you can get for this. You can buy $1 each, or you can get five for only $4. And the five books are Sex in Your Body by Professor E. M. Orlick, uh, Intimate Sex Discussions, Sexual Happiness, Anatomy of Sex, and Sex and Exercise. So I don't know if that would help you guys out, but you might be interested in that. Well, Ron, Ron actually was a subscriber to that magazine when it came out. And, uh, <laughs> yes, I have all the 1952 issues. Dusty. <laughs> so, so he actually got all, he got the bundle for four bucks. He's it sounds sick. like they, it sounds like they did pretty good for 1952. A lot of, a lot of good recommendations there. 
I couldn't uh, handle waiting for the, the, the sh- books to ship. That would have been a real problem for me. Yes. Uh, another thing that I found interesting in a different uh, magazine called Muscle Power, uh, I found Dusty Hanshaw in this. It, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, it was uh, my 20th birthday. So it's it's kind of crazy. Oh, yeah, my right. young, Dusty, young, young Dusty. <laughs> there he is. Is that an article on how to take women on dates? It's, it's called Let's Gossip. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Story. We're on a roll already here. I, that's where the be- I used the beard to make it not appear that I was in that magazine. See, that's the photo that proves that time travel is real and happening, Dusty. <laughs> you know how you know that wasn't me, Will, though, for real? His biceps were way better. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Uh, moving on. As you guys can see, I'm a huge comic book fan and I love hearing about characters' origin stories. So I want to start off this interview hearing about your origin stories. So can you guys tell me what it was like, what your childhood was like, and what led you guys to becoming bodybuilders? Ron, you got to fire this first, man. I mean, I'm going to go first. Yeah, I want to hear this. Uh, How do I sum this up? Um, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, it is interesting to look back and wonder why you do the things you do. And I'm sure, Will, when you're my age, you'll be looking back at all the amazing things that you've accomplished by that point, seeing as you're off to such a good start, which I'm sure I speak for Dusty and myself when I say that you're kicking ass at this age. I can't imagine where you're going to be when you're like 20, 23, 25, 27, you know what I mean? So it's, it's awesome that you're getting on top of all this stuff and, and pioneering your own thing in your own way. And um, a lot of the character traits that, it takes to do your own thing at a young age, like what you're doing are, you probably don't see it right now, but they're Im- immensely valuable when you're older, you know, like doing, you know, thinking for yourself, not caring what other people say, just trying shit, you know, experimenting, let's try this, see if it works like that. So that sort of attitude is, is what success breeds success. So uh, first of all, I want to say that I, I think you're, you're, you're doing awesome by getting out there and doing this sort of stuff. Um, but as far as my start in bodybuilding, uh, I, I was raised on a farm, so, you know, it was very blue collar and hard work and you know what I mean? Like you, you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself and fend for yourself. So I had that, that real like independent spirit kind of bred into me. And I guess bodybuilding just kind of like, uh, I've just kind of caught my attention in, in that way because, you know, you get what you, you get what you put into it. You can't blame anybody else. You know, everything is right there in front of you to do. You eat the diet, do the training. Like, you know what I mean? It's all about hard work and all that sort of stuff. So I think that that's a big part of, I guess, the origin story of of how I got started. And then, of course, you got to throw in, you know, seeing Conan the Barbarian when I was 13 years old and going, <laughs> ah, I want to look like that. Well, right. <laughs> I, I just want to stop you right there, Ron. Uh, okay. A couple months ago, my dad uh, put on Conan, and he's like, I think you're really going to like this. And he forgot about all the naked girls that are in it. So he's like, oh, okay, this is in it. And you liked it, right? Yeah, it was awesome. (laughs) See, dad was right. This is a great (laughs) flick. Again, I was 13. I was like, I want to look like that. (laughs) (laughs) Look what it's done for him. (laughs) Yeah, look what it's done for him. I want to hang out in a cave with naked women all day. So, uh, so yeah, that's my origin story. And then, you know, it just sort of... uh, I think as a teenager too, you know, I was doing something different that not everybody else was doing. And, and I think when you get positive feedback, you know, like the, you know, like your peers and, and, and even your teachers and and your coaches and stuff start saying like, yeah, like you're, you're getting pretty strong. And, you know, the other guys at the gym, like, oh man, you're, you're, you know, you're getting pretty wide. And like, you know, just, it, you start to see like, this is changing me. And, and then you, you hit a point, I don't know how old I was, but you start to appreciate that it's not just changing you physically, but it's changing you mentally because you start doing things and you start realizing like, oh, I'm, I don't know if I would have had the confidence to do that if I hadn't have, you know, been banging away at the gym at a young age and sort of, because it builds your confidence, you know, yeah. setting goals, saying, okay, I'm going to add a plate to the hack squat by summertime, like no matter what, you know, like that sort of stuff. And yeah. a lot of kids, a lot of kids your age and my age at the time, they don't put any building blocks together really for a while. They don't have anything that they're, they're stacking, you know? And I I think that when you're young and you have something, some that you're you're setting mini goals and and mega goals. And I think that just kind of like, you know, it it changes your, your mental outlook. Yeah. 
I just want to say thank you for what you said. And didn't you say that when you were in high school, Ron, that you weighed like 130 pounds at the beginning and you got out like 230 pounds or was it 100 and 200? Yeah. So it was the very end of grade nine. Um, we call high school grade 10, 11, 12. That's how I yeah. grew up. So at the very end of what we call junior high, grade nine, um, I was 138. And that's when I started training. And then uh, by the end of grade 12, I was 230. So it was almost 100 pounds. Yeah. 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 I grew a lot in high school. I, I'm in my, I'm in year 10. And when, okay. before I started ninth, I was 95 pounds and now I'm 140. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a ton. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we'll also remember, like, I, I don't know how true this is, but someone told it to me. So I always repeat it as if it's absolute scientific fact. Dusty knows how I work. For sure. Um, um, but uh, I was told by by um, like a, um, a professional coach, a strength and conditioning coach when I was young, that for every 10 pounds you gain, you gain a pound of bone density from lifting weights. So, you know, your bones get stronger and they get thicker and denser and you become just a bigger person. And even if you stop training and lose all your muscle, you never lose like, you're, you're, yeah. you know, that bone is there too. And you just become more solid. And and then also as you're growing with all your hormones racing, you know, your year 10, like just wait till year 12, like, you know, maybe you would have normally put on 30 pounds in high school, just growing, but now you get to magnify that. Yeah. You know, by grade 12, who knows how much weight you're going to put on because, you know, you've taken advantage of this perfect growth spurt, you know, everything's just firing yeah. away. So yeah, watch out. Will. I'm envious of that. Uh, growth spurt. I could use one now. Yeah, yeah. You're going to put on more weight in the next three years than, than you know, a bodybuilder does in 10, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, I, I went from having like three meals a day to now having like six. So Yeah, that your parents love feeding you too, I bet, right? Yeah. <laughs> what do your friends think about that, all that other eating? They got to think you're nuts. Yeah, they because I, I was at school the other day and I'm having lunch and I'm like, this is my third meal. And they're like, what? This is my first. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it, it's funny. And, and uh, Dusty and I have talked about this too. Like we, we were never short on food as kids. And, and I was pretty fortunate to grow up on a farm and have all the food I ever wanted to eat. And, and sometimes you meet kids that they don't eat very much. Or they don't have the, you know, they don't have the resources and the, the food isn't like free. And it really makes you appreciate, you know, the situation you're in. So you know, take advantage of it, man. Yeah. At the beginning of this year, uh, like no one at school talked to me at all. I sat alone at lunch for the longest time. And just like this past week, people started talking to me ever since I started doing a podcast. So, so, so <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, say, I have to assume that works. I was, it was funny because I was, there's, there's an individual that was bothering me on social media that's claiming to be very well known. And I just like to go in to see who follows someone. And I'm like, Oh, no one. You have 215,000 followers, allegedly, and no one in the industry follows you. Then I go to your page. And I'm like, oh, it's like the who's who of bodybuilding follows Will. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Literally every single top pro, top amateur, yeah, popular I, I, name. <laughs> so yeah, let, me, let me ask you this, Will. So you've had like, you've had Fuad, Ian, Chris. Bumstead. You've had a bunch Seth. of guys on. Seth. Yeah, yeah, okay. So which guest has gotten you the most street cred oh, is boy. it bumstead or fuad or ian i'm not sure well, have honestly, you had hollingshead on yet the, i think where i got the most attention from was fuad and nick walker chris oh, i gained right. like chris i gained like a hundred but with combined with fuad and nick i gained over two thousand followers uh so. no were they on together nope no, so two. Okay, so Nick and Do Nick you think it's possible that you got all those followers because they could tell you pitied those two for just having them on and they just aren't on your level? Maybe it, it was nice <laughs> of you to help Fu add out. <laughs> yeah, he's had such a hard time with the following, you know. And and you probably gave Nick some tips on how to get big, so that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's generous yeah. of you. So what about the kids at school? Like, do the the kids at school they they know who these guys are a little bit? Are they realizing that you're talking to like? They only you know, know who Chris Bumstead is. <laughs> of course. It's like That's my nice. mother. My mom would move me off the screen if Chris was on the show. <laughs> but get out of the way. Yeah. You're in the way. That big head of yours in the way. What, <laughs> what about, have you had any girls that are like, you know Chris Bumstead? Nope. Oh, it's all guys. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's like, uh, it's 
like the memes you see on Instagram where it's like expectation when you get bigger and it's like, oh, you expect all these girls to come to you and it's just other guys coming to you saying like, nice gains. You look good, bro. Big, bro. It's so true. It's so, I'm glad you know that early, man. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You know what? Uh, we underestimate the uh, educational power of the meme, Dusty. Exactly. <laughs> They're getting like an advanced notice. We, we put years into this stuff thinking that size matters. It wasn't until I got older that I realized it was the size of the wallet they were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, don't forget I'm that. Supposed to be rich. Definitely oh, don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> but what about you, Jesse? What was your childhood like and what led you to become a bodybuilder? Uh, so mine was a little more straightforward. Um, I was a hockey player since I was a kid. And that was, I only had. I was someone who didn't believe in a plan B. Um, uh, that was the plan. I, I moved out when I was 16 years old to go play hockey. And uh, I lived with another family, like a, a billet family. So I had so I could legally be there. Um, hockey was the only plan. I ended up getting injured. Uh, and I thought it was a temporary, just an injury. I had a second surgery, a uh, shoulder issue. And I should have been just right back into it. And then about three months after the shoulder surgery, I played in a celebrity game, which was no hitting, no fighting. And I was sore for days. Um, and I realized, because I was just a really violent player, that uh, my game was probably out the window at this point. So I, I stopped without going back because I just knew I was going to be a shell of what I was. Yeah. But I didn't have a plan. Um, so I had to get a nine to five, which I hated. Um, and then I needed an outlet for the, uh, I guess, athletic side of me. And Don't forget I mean, the hostility. You know, yes, and the anger, anger management classes. Um, so no, we. Uh, I got. I went to a gym. I was always strong. I was that kid that like I didn't really train a bunch in high school like a lot of guys. I did some, but just kind of like the show me muscles. But I was just really strong always. Like they had that when I was a kid. I don't know if they have this now, will, but they had like the seven hundred club, the eight hundred, the nine hundred, the thousand pound club with like three lifts. And when I was a junior in high school, I did that the first time, and I literally. I did my bench and I did my clean and I said, okay, how many pounds do I need to get to a thousand pounds for squats? And then they just told me the number. I was like, okay, put that on. So that was, that was my way of assessing getting to a thousand pounds. Um, I think I had to do like a 580 squat when I was like 17 and I was like, okay, that should be reasonable. Um, so I've always been strong, but uh, I got into bodybuilding. I literally went to the gym, decided I was going to work out and there was a sign on the, on the wall for a show, it was like eight weeks out. And I was like, I'm gonna do that. Um, I just opted to do it. I had no idea what I was doing. I ate uh, two cans of tuna every two and a half hours all day long. It's the only thing I ate. Um, I got in shape, I had no muscle. I had the structure I have now, only imagine with less muscle, it was even more terrible. Um, <laughs> Plus mercury but, poisoning. And, and I hated the, you know, it's funny is I hated the entire time, but I was too stubborn to quit. I was like, well, I'm just going to finish this stupid show and then I'll never do this again. And I did the show and I liked it. Um, and I realized looking around that there was a, a chance to improve. Um, and at the time, I didn't know why, but I thought, you know, I could probably do something with this because uh, I had originally planned on going to college after I missed uh, the hockey window. And my father actually told me not to. He was like, look, you're pretty much unemployable. You can't work for someone. So my advice is you find a way to own a business and, and do that instead. So I actually took his advice for once in my life because I realized like I don't do really, really well with authority. So um, <clears throat> I just worked a job and uh, eventually ended up uh, working at a supplement store. Um, and that's when I really realized I love bodybuilding because now I was learning the supplement side, learning how the body worked. And that also created my my way of getting into the industry because I ended up buying those stores like five years later. So, yeah, that was my that was my crank that got me in the industry. And then, thank God for uh, YouTube, Instagram, and social media because I wouldn't have a career without those things. Because you know we can't all look like Nick Walker. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later on the show, but we're off to a pretty good start. We're 20 minutes in. We got through one question. Nice. So, that's typical of us. That's that's our normal pace. Yeah, we usually answer yeah. three for two hours, so we're doing good. Yeah, and then the 300 people that don't get their question asked are like, oh. Yeah. All right. But can I hear your guys' uh, thoughts on coaching? Is this something that I need, like, this early on? Or when do you think, like, it's a good point to add in a coach? 
Um, I mean, I think there's there's multiple ways to look at it. It's funny because, um, <clears throat> for example, I know if you ha- when you have uh, Jose Raymond on, he will he will answer this the opposite of me. Um, Jose would say you should learn everything you can on your own, <clears throat> take it as far as you can, learn your own body, and then hire a coach. Um, I disagree, and the reason I do is because I think if you've got the money, pay for someone else to make that already made those mistakes. You're still learning what works for you. You're just not wasting as much time learning what doesn't work. Um, and if you have the right coach, they'll take the time to help you understand what you're doing. Uh, so, like for example, I tell all my clients, this isn't a democracy, but I do want your input. And you're always welcome to ask me why we're doing something because nothing that we do is random and people tend to do better if they understand why they're doing something, especially if it's weird. You know, if all of a sudden you're doing something they've never heard of, as soon as you can put them at ease with what it is and why you're doing it, it's like, oh, okay. And they can follow through easier. So I think it's beneficial to have a coach, but I think you need to do your homework on making sure it's the right coach. Plus with your level of uh, knowledge now and experience, you could probably just have a really good training partner in the gym and just go to someone online. And you seem to know quite a few decent coaches now. So I bet you could find <laughs> someone that would help you. Yeah. I'm, right now I'm in the process of like trying to get one right now. I reached out to someone and we're trying to get this whole thing straightened out. But yeah, I, when I talked to Fuad, I like a week ago, I called him and he was like, yeah, you like it's, I think you do need like the whole, like, person to person so you can get the technique down but he said i mean there's not a lot of people here in connecticut that are like top coaches uh so he said maybe just for the time being like just like reach out to someone get on their program or whatever but i think you're in connecticut i I do need the like person to person interaction so i can like learn the techniques and everything i i think i think also to um like with the Jose and Dusty, what Dusty meant there, I, I think that the money thing is a big issue. So, you know, like, let's say someone's like, a, like kind of like tight for cash and they're scrounging. That's, you know, that's, they're, that was in the position I was in for food. And, you know, a young, young guy doesn't have a lot of money. And, and sometimes in those cases, I say you're probably better off to just really keep things basic and focus on getting stronger and eating to, to make sure you're gaining weight. You know what I mean? Like those foundational years. The, if you have the cash and or you find someone who gives you a, a good deal or whatever, the price makes sense and, and you think that they can help you, then then yeah, I mean, they're going to save you time and, and you're, you know, essentially Dusty is completely right. You're Some people think a coach is going to like miraculously change everything, but but they're actually really trying to prevent you from making mistakes. That's actually like a huge part of being a coach is helping people from wasting their time. So that can be really valuable too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you are sort of lucky in that you're not in a stage where it's all about minutia, you know, (laughs) like, you know what I mean? It's not about the penny. It's about the other 99 cents and, and lifting heavy with proper form, going hard, eating lots. That's really, I mean, that's, what's going to get you through the next few years and really pack the pounds on you. Yeah. Uh, Dusty, I'm sorry. I think I might have cut you off when I went talking. But no, we're... you're fine. No, basically, it's 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 you're on the. You right have track, to cut Dusty off, or he doesn't <clears throat> stop. Which is true. This is a fact. No, if you if you just stay focused on the basics, like Ron said, that's going to be key. And if you do need someone in the gym, keep in mind because because you are correct. I have my clients, and Ron and I talk about this off the air all the time. Where I can write you a routine, and it would be brutal if you did it with me. But you might message me the next day and be like, yeah, I think I need a little more volume. That was easy. And I immediately know, okay, you're not taking that as hard as you should be. And intensity is not about weight. You know, it's about execution and, and basically taking the, each set that you're doing to absolute failure. So you may be someone in a place where once you learn the technique, you're meeting someone in the gym every now and then to really make sure your intensity is, is rising, rising, rising. And being that you're in Connecticut, I mean, to be honest with you, as soon as you said that, I was like, I can think of 10 people. I don't know where you are in Connecticut. It's not exactly a small place, but I mean, there's lots of options and there's a lot of good coaches that could do the online side. I do the same for my clients locally. I don't train people in the gym. I just don't have time, don't have the desire. 
But a lot of my clients see my training partner for, for the training. Mm -hmm. He'll literally take them through, even if it's once a month, he'll take them through one of my workouts just to make sure that everything's correct. Yeah. Or I'll even tell them, hey, I'm not really loving what's going on with their delts. I need to get them in with you to train shoulders and I need you to figure out what we're doing wrong here. You mm -hmm. know, so, so that's an option for you as well. Yeah, like the guy I was with, he based a lot of his training off of uh, JP with like the slow controlled reps and then like mm -hmm. the eight to 10 uh, and that sort of thing, but like really intense. Yeah. And I, I always write down my stuff when I'm doing in the gym. So like I would write down how many I got. And if it was like eight or more, I'd go up like a pound or two the next week and try and get eight or nine or whatever. With the I'm glad you said a pound yeah. or two. That's, that's beautiful. If you don't have them, and I tell this to all my clients too, you can go on Amazon and literally order one pound increments of weight. And that, for some reason, everyone's afraid of that. Like I laugh. I, I've seen guys be like, I went up a 25 aside and I'm like, <laughs> well, no wonder you got murdered. Like you squeaked up 13 reps last week and added 50 pounds. It's not shocking that you got six. You know yeah, what I mean? I heard, yeah. I heard like JP carries around like a one pounders in his bag all the time. I think sure. he has like grand. Does he even have like 250 gram plates? Wouldn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. I even I have bags of, uh, of beads that are weights too that you can put on stacks that you can literally just put on top of them that are like two pounds a piece. Yeah, because you know, when you get to that point, I mean, it's not even just you. I mean, when you're at a point where you're trying to inch your way up in pounds, this isn't about being young or new. I mean, hell, your jumps are probably faster than ours. Sometimes I'm like, I got one more rep, right? Since two weeks ago, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, I want to get outside of bodybuilding uh, just for a little bit. Uh, I know Ron, you love BMX yes. uh, and like doing the tricks and on the on like the flatland and doing all sorts of stuff uh but i had to prepare for this interview so i had to watch the most important movie for this so i watched rad one of my dad's favorite movies of all time yes crew and jones. my my grandfather was one of the uh main guys in it he oh. was the he was the owner of mongoose oh is it like he played the owner of mongoose no, I'm just kidding. Oh, uh, he looks exactly like him, though. It, the guy is identical to my grandfather. That's funny. Uh, so, but I, I, th I think it's just so cool seeing you got seeing you, Ron, like such a big guy on such a small bike, and seeing you be able to do all that stuff. I think that's absolutely awesome. And I, I've heard like you rarely ever use a car, but. <laughs> When did you get into this whole thing, and when did you decide that this is like something like like your hidden passion, like your second passion that you like to do? <laughs> well, technically, it was my first passion. So, uh -huh. yeah, because I, you know, back when I was your age, I was living on my flatland bike. Um, I started. I, I saw. I think I saw Rad when I was like eleven or something, and I was like just obsessed with BMX, and. And it was the bikes and the culture and, you know, they're doing the tricks and all the bikes are like back then they're all like bright blue and pink and chrome and like it was all yeah. flashy. And and it was California, the second thing from California that got me, you know, <laughs> so I, I just I just got obsessed and I started doing tricks on my bike. And of course, it just had like a normal BMX. I had to put pegs yeah. on it and, you know, and then I advanced to like an actual freestyle bike and then I got like a pro level bike. And and by the time I was like you know, in grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, I was like riding my bike all the time and I was getting pretty good. And then of course, grade 11 comes, you get yourself a car, you know, <laughs> you're hanging out with chicks, you're playing football, you know, so much time for the little bike anymore. And, um, and basically my whole life, I would always check in with freestyle. I would every once in a while, I'd be walking past the magazine rack and I'd stop and grab a BMX magazine. I'd flip through and I'd be like, oh, fuck, the bikes look pretty cool now. And like, look what they're doing. Oh, this is neat. This is new. And like, oh, who are these guys? I don't know these names. And I'd, I'd kind of like check back in and see what they're doing and how they'd progressed. And, and then of course, you know, YouTube came along in 2005 and, and then every VHS tape that I'd missed for BMX all of a sudden was on YouTube. So then I, I kind of caught up and I, I, I always paid attention to it and I would surprise the odd person. Like I remember meeting a guy who was into BMX and I just started talking bikes with him and he was like, holy shit, you know, like everything about like up to that point, I think it was like 2005 or whatever, but he's like, holy shit. Like you haven't been on a bike for ages and you know everything about bikes. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I love it. Like, and I watched the X games, you know, they came along in 95, yeah. all of a sudden the X games were on TV and I was like, oh fuck awesome. I used to do this. And, 
and I was watching all the X games stuff. And so I always loved it. And the whole thing was, I just didn't want to get hurt. <laughs> and I was 300 pounds. So those two things were like, well, I'm not getting on a fucking bike. I'll kill myself. <laughs> I would pay to see you on a bike. Right. Funny. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, but then with, you know, the last few years, allowing my body weight to come down, you know, getting smaller and, you know, focusing on other things and running the businesses. And all of a sudden, you know, one, I remember one day, like during last August, I remember one morning I got up and I was 250. And I hadn't been 250, like, since I was like on stage, like 15 years ago. <laughs> and I thought, huh, 250 is big, but 250 is not that big. Like he's rounding and, himself down. <laughs> right. Well, just think like, you know, linebackers are 250. Yeah. They can run and jump. And I'm thinking like, it's still on the big end of things, but I wonder if it's small enough. And that's when I started like, fuck, maybe I'll put a bike together. And then all of a sudden, once the idea was in my head, you know, sitting around for two months with the shutdown, I'm like, you know, a, a lot of it became an obsession <laughs> during, during, during the, the first shutdown that everyone went through. Cause we only had one shutdown here. So during the first shutdown that everybody had, I think a lot of seeds went through a lot of people's heads trying to like come up with stuff to kill time. And, and, and that just, yeah, once it was in there, I was like, fuck, I'm doing this. And then, and once I started building the bike, I'm like, oh fuck, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm doing this. I would shake my head every day. Like, I can't believe I'm going to get it back. I'm going to actually get on this thing. And yeah, that's just how it started. And, and now I just, I just really appreciate the, uh, the process of, uh, like I said, stacking bricks, Yeah. you know, cause bodybuilding to me was all about progress. And, you know, I guess, you know, I'm still, I still train with a progressive mindset cause I'm always yeah. trying to like you know, get stronger because there's, there's a reason why, like, you know, I hurt my shoulder last year and my elbow bugged me six months ago. And, you know, like, so there's always something I'm kind of coming back from and trying to maintain a base level of, of strength and size. So yeah. I can have a little bit of street cred. Yeah. When, <laughs> you gotta remember, we were... Think about this, Will, think about this so real quick, his poor girlfriend. So she <laughs> signs up for a man child who's into lifting weights and hanging out in his underwear. And he finally retires. She's like, yes, he's going to grow up. And he's like, I got a bike. And she's like, fuck. Yeah, now she's dating a 16-year-old. <laughs> like, it was a 22-year-old, and he just keeps regressing. So yeah. It sounds like my dad was skateboards. Yeah. Uh, my, my dad was back skateboard. He would skateboard all the time when he was a kid, and he does it now. Uh, but when this whole quarantine thing, like, started, it's like we were in here for, like, three months. I couldn't leave the house or anything. And I got so bored so fast because I, I literally wasn't able to leave the street or the house. I had to stay like in our yard. So I would do like I would ride my bike a lot and I would skateboard a lot. And I would like every other day I would do like bike one day, I would skate the next day and I would do some try and learn tricks on it and stuff. Now I can do like two tricks total because I just keep practicing that same trick over and over again. And finally, when this whole quarantine thing like opened, it was like you can go to some places. Like, uh, we're, take us to the skate park. We want to go on ramps and stuff. We want to do something fun. So they take us there. I'm like, what the heck happened? Gone. It's freaking, like, destroyed. It's gone. It's everywhere. And I heard in school, the teacher was talking about how in in South Windsor, uh, here in Connecticut, they were like, yeah, we filled all our, uh, we put boards around the fences, and then we filled it with sand so that no one could skate or uh, bike in it. Yeah, like, they filled they filled all the skate parks in some areas to prevent people from using them during COVID. It's it's and then they just left them that way. Yeah, it's it's unbelievably stupid. Yeah, and then <laughs> I was gonna say the logic is not even flawed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But he said that the people tore down the boards and just sweeped it out. Yeah, nice. that happened in California. The whole bunch of guys shoveled out the skate parks. <laughs> As they should. It's crazy though. Ridiculous. But, Dusty, what do you do? What what do you like to do outside of bodybuilding or is bodybuilding your thing? Right now, I mean, it's really bodybuilding and business are kind of the only things I do. I don't have a lot of uh, outside for the same reason. Um, I used to, I rode motorcycles my whole life and my technically second car. And was, uh, also too, Dusty, you wash your car so often that it's a hobby. Valid point. Well, I mean, I watch someone wash them but yes watch. i take it to get washed <laughs> i've got another wash appointment yeah, it's, it's but anyways that's that's beyond <laughs> but no um so i think the same thing happened though is 
Uh, when I started making money from bodybuilding, I sold uh, my last custom bike, just knowing that an injury was going to come. And the plan was always to get another one back. But since everyone drives down the streets on their cell phones looking at down, I have uh, basically gotten rid of the idea that I'll ever order, own a motorcycle again, unless I lived in the middle of nowhere. It's a, it's like it was always dangerous. Yeah. Um, but you you had the well, my bike is loud. People can hear it. I should be okay. Uh, now it's just asinine. Yeah, I mean, right. People aren't looking. I, I drive a tank for a reason. I, I went through a small phase where I was thinking of getting a bike. It would have been like around like ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh-huh. I was like, huh, maybe I'll get a bike, you know, and I was admiring some of my friends were getting bikes. And then one summer I knew three guys that wound up in wheelchairs on sport bikes. Well, three. I, and I, I was like, I know, I know uh, Ben Chow got into a huge motorcycle accident. Like he yep. said, he, he almost got, like, died. He like got into a like collision and he, he said he like he had handprints in the hood of the car. Yeah. Like he was like Superman coming down. He threw his head on the windshield of the car. Yeah, when he was done, yeah, because and, and he was wearing a helmet that got pulled off during the accident. Yeah, a backpack pulled his helmet off that he was wearing. Like that's like that, that's when you know it's not your time to die. But yeah, I know a few <laughs> that are uh, they're huge accidents. It's just it stopped being worth it. But I, but I still have that uh, that thing. I got I I have plenty of itches that I, that I'm thinking about. The problem will is when you get to to where I'm at. Every itch you want to scratch is about a hundred grand. <laughs> so <laughs> you gotta really decide if you want to scratch that itch or not. And some you can't put on your visa. <laughs> like exactly. uh, my my grandfather has an old Harley in his. He lives in Massachusetts, and he has uh, a motorcycle that he hasn't used since the nineties, and he's gonna give it to me. But I'm gonna tear it all apart and i'm just gonna like basically rebuild it uh right. but i i wanted to like just, i want to get it but it's like how are we gonna get there from here we tried it one way and it's like oh it doesn't fit in there so we got we're trying to like get it down i want to put a big fat tire on the back of it but i think it'll be cool but i'm definitely very scared to drive it if I if i had it. a bike if i had a bike i would strategically use it for a sunday cruise or something yeah yep. and i would never drive like you know, high traffic areas and rush hour and all that stuff. It would be like, you know, I'd be out in the country or something. Yeah. And I always get freaked out when um, we're on like the highway or something and we see a motorcycle just go zipping by going through the lanes really fast. I'm like, yeah. Ninjas. Yeah. They only have to fall once before they realize that wasn't a great idea. (laughs) Uh, The next thing I wanted to talk about was like your work ethic, your work ethic. Uh, you guys are really hard workers. When I see you guys uh, post on Instagram, I'm like, oh, these guys are going crazy in the gym. You're really hard workers. But the thing uh, is that you two got your pro cards a little bit later in the game. Uh, you got it when you're a little bit older. Uh, like, what was that like for you? Because you got it later than most people have it now. Like, people now have it in like their late 20s or early 30s. Uh, but like, did, do you think like getting it late affected like what you would have been able to do? Well, I always say like I turned pro when I was 39. But I always say that I wouldn't change a thing. Because it, it if I would have got it earlier, like I won my first nas- national title in 07. And so let's say I would have won the overall that year, which I could have, like, it was a super close overall. There was three of us that had votes from judges for the win. The you know, one guy walked away with the card and then there was two more of us that had first place votes. So let's just say I would have turned pro that year. Well, there was no Instagram. Facebook was only a year old. Um, I, I feel like I would have been, you know, uh, a new Canadian pro that nobody knew. And it probably would have been like, close to the end of my career. Like, what would I have done? You know, all those years I spent sort of at the top of the amateur level. um, I I appreciate that time because that was how I was able to make a name for myself and stand out and get to know everyone. And, and I I think, you know, uh, for me personally, with the amount of talent I had, which was average, um, I'm not sure if turning pro earlier would have helped my career at all. 
Um, I think that, you know, things happened pretty much in a pretty awesome way for me and I wouldn't change a thing. Um, you know, obviously everyone wants to be Jay Cutler and turn pro when they're 23 and, uh, you know, be getting second at the O when they're 26 and all that sort of shit. But, uh, unless you're Jay Cutler turning pro early, doesn't do much for you. You know what I mean? That's just sort of how I appreciate things and how I look at it. I think that Ron nailed it. It was the same for me. I was 30, <laughs> 33 when I turned pro, but I didn't even start really bodybuilding. Uh, I mean, I started actually like with a coach and figuring out what I was doing in 2008. Um, and I turned pro in 2014. Um, I only did four years of pro qualifiers. I think one thing that threw people off, because even, even some of the other interviewers, like Dave Palumbo at one point when I won, he was like, man, what's it been, like 10 years? And I'm like, four it's been four years but i think it's because i did well right away um and at the super heavyweight level back then 2010 the first pro qualifier i did the top 10 are pros now so yeah. it was it was a stacked uh time period but just like ron man in 2011 my entire prep i was good enough to win and chris and i and I take the fault for it. I told Chris when we started that prep, I wanted to be peeled. Like that was all I said. I just want to be skinless. Um, had we come in where I was at about four weeks out, without question, I would have won that show. Um, meanwhile, it took me then three more years. I took 10th to give you an idea of how far, how much muscle we lost uh, those last four weeks. But um, looking back, I'm so glad it happened that way. Because just like Ron, I would have turned pro. I would have gotten smoked as a pro um, and I, it, you lose the ability to have traction. Instead, I spent four years being a front runner. Every show I did, people were wondering if I was going to win. Yeah. Um, people talking during, about you all year long. Yeah. And during that time I was building a following. It's, it sucks. The, the biggest mistake I made was with YouTube. I built my YouTube on my sponsor's platform. Yeah. So I had a huge YouTube following on their platform. And then what was funny was after they and I parted ways in a semi not great way, um, the guy who was controlling their YouTube, uh, he got fired or had a a bad outing. He deleted their entire YouTube. (laughs) So all of my videos were gone. Now I have them, but I don't have the views anymore. And I mean, it's fine because I, I have the the credibility that came with it. But in hindsight, had I built those on my own channel, life would be a hell of a lot different right now. I mean, we had a hundred thousand followers back then. And and I started over a couple of years ago with zero, you know? So that was my only error um, during that time. But yeah, I wouldn't change anything. And I, and I feel bad actually. I see it a lot now. In fact, there's a guy that I helped just recently. He turned pro at his second show. And now he's got delusions that are going to destroy him. Like he's getting ready for, he's getting ready for, he was going to do the New York pro. Now he's doing the show here and he literally is telling people, I'm going to win that show and I'm going to go to the Olympia. And I'm like, you're going to get smoked at that show. Yeah. (laughs) Another thing too, uh, I mean, Dusty caught the tail end of this, um, you know, because I started so many years earlier, but the fact that I competed in the nineties and then in all through the two thousands, um, the, the, the level of competition was, staggering even up in here in canada and you're turning pro at those shows was no joke like i remember lots of years there was several years where there were over 30 super heavyweights at the canadas and now like you see like five show up six show up right Um, of the six three of them are ready yeah and of the six three of them are ready whereas back in the you know when i was doing it like there'd be 30 super show up and you i'd be looking around the pump up room i remember several years where i looked around the pump up room and i was like am i gonna make the top 10 like these this is fuck these guys look good because you know you're not in their shape and structure in the pump up room you're just seeing like everybody fucking getting ready and you're like well this guy's arms are bigger than mine that guy's arms are bigger than mine what the fuck holy shit this might be a rough year and then I'd go out and make first call out and land in the top two and be like, okay, fuck, I still got it. <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of relief some years because it, it was just getting so crazy. And then to go to North Americans, like what Dusty mentioned there, like those shows were no joke. Like I got um, I got a couple of six places at the North Americans, but I look back at those six 
And I'm like, oh, the top eight are all pro now. Yeah. Oh, and the next show where I got sixth, the top eight are all pro now. And then that year I got fourth, the top yeah. six are all pro now. And like just down the line, like the shows were stacked. And, and you know, it's, it, you know, these guys that are like, oh, I got my pro card on my first try and whatever. I mean, sometimes they're just that good. Yeah. But sometimes the show just wasn't that good. Yeah. Now, Dustin, you brought up the whole like sponsorship and YouTube thing. And this next question is a two part question. Uh, it's focused towards you, Dusty, but Ron, you can like uh, chip in a little bit. Uh, but Dusty, when you first joined Mutant, can you tell me what it was like when people didn't think that you should be a part of that team? Now, I know that you had support from like Ron and some other people, but what helped you get through that negativity and like stay positive during that whole thing? Actually, with Mutant, it was. It was it was simple. Um, prior to them, when I started with iForce Nutrition, I had gotten in purely because right place, right time. To be honest with you, I own my retail stores. Uh, the owner of iForce, it was a very 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 small company. Uh, he came into my stores, and uh, I, I kind of knew him, but not really. And I was in shape. I was getting ready for a show. This was the one of the first shows I did uh, on my own, uh, 2006. And uh, he came in and he just saw that I looked good. I wasn't like a big guy. I surely wasn't a threat to be a pro or anything. But he said, hey, you know, would you want to come to the Arnold with me and work the booth? And I was like, well, sure. I mean, if you'll pay me, I'll, I'll do that. So it seemed like it'd be fun. So I went to the Arnold. We did a, we did a, we did the booth. And I trained uh, after the show. And he, he actually saw me. I peeled down to take pictures. And uh, he was like, oh, shit, you're in shape. Um, you want to do, would you do a photo shoot for me? And I was like, sure. I mean, if you'll pay me, I'll, I'll do a photo shoot. So two weeks later, we did a shoot and we just started developing. Like it was kind of worked out well, is my point. It's just a little bit of luck. Like you've got a guy who has a small company, no following, trying to build up. And you have a bodybuilder who's in the same place, just getting rolling. So we just kind of joined forces and grew. Uh, and by the time I left iForce, because of the videos we were doing and Todd, the guy who still does my videos and built up their YouTube, actually, when I went to Mutant, uh, I emailed Ron and I talked to, I think, three or four other companies. I emailed, I emailed all of them. And actually, every company um, gave me an offer at that time. But the big thing was we put up a post. I don't know if it was me or Mutant. I think it was me saying... You know who do you think i'm signing with and it wasn't even done yet but i already knew ron and i had already kind of worked it out and literally the only answers were mutant and animal all the way down the line so it, it wasn't even and what was crazy is mutant had a big enough following at the time i i didn't mean to but i put up a picture of one of their shakes mixed not realizing that the tendency of their shake is different and i literally put up a picture in a clear glass and i had like five people be like that's strawberry mutant uh Pro 100, and I was like, oh, shit. I oh, yeah, I remember gave, that. Gave, I gave away the answer on accident. Yeah, you were like, Who's, whose shake is this? Who did I sign with? And everyone's like, that's Mutant Strawberry. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. I mean, it was like immediate. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I just thought it was a strawberry shake. I didn't realize you could tell the difference. But yeah, so the the, the crossover to Mutant was was easy. Um, I think what, what you're really more leaning towards, Will, is a lot of people mm, – for the longest time in my career, I was never the best bodybuilder. And, and that was never a secret to me either. And I think that that bothered people because back in the 90s, as Ron will tell you, as long as you looked good and could win, you could be dumber than a brick, have no personality. They didn't need you to do anything. They needed you to win bodybuilding shows. You needed you to win shows and look good in magazines. Yeah. That was and, it. I mean, and they would speak for you. Like even the quotes in magazines. Yeah, the articles. didn't say that. They didn't write it. They did. Whereas when I took over my career, I knew all I had was I was strong. I was big, but it was ugly. And I was smart. So I was like, I can't have anyone putting words in my mouth. So I literally in my contracts was like, you cannot speak for me. You can't quote me in a quote I didn't say. Um, I will not promote a product I don't use. Even Mutant was great about that. I never once mentioned a product that they made that I didn't use. So if I mentioned it, it was something I used. Yeah, it bothered people a lot because you had a lot better bodybuilders that were making nothing. And when I was an amateur, I was making six figures off of bodybuilding as an amateur. 
and, and you got guys that aren't surviving that would smoke me on stage and they, they couldn't understand that the, the game had changed. I, I went through that a lot too. I had, when I was an amateur with mutant, um, I had a lot of pros contact me and they're like, how did you get a contract? Like, what do I have to do? And I was like, I don't know, like show up on time and be nice to everybody. I don't know. I've heard stories about you, <laughs> you know, yeah, like we like asshole. literally, literally <laughs> I'd, I'd hear stories about, you know, pro X doesn't show up on time, difficult to deal with. And then they email you and go, how did you get a sponsor as an amateur? And it's like, well, like, you know, you're obviously not hearing the stories I'm hearing. Well, I but think people forget too. It's a, it's a small industry. And Ron remembers when I reached out to him, I had owned, a, I had owned my business. I had had some business issues that weren't uh, positive between myself and companies. Um, they weren't secrets, but I was, I was definitely not afraid to uh, throw the middle finger at a few people on the business side. And those companies had reached out to Mutant to try to kind of slander me. And I had enough of a positive following from everything else that they literally didn't blink. They're like, uh-huh, yeah. okay, whatever. Well, plus Ryan at the time, Remember the one story was, uh, well, well, when Dusty owned his stores, this is what, you know, we had this thing. And then when I, when I, you know, I was like, well, I have to show Ryan this email. Cause I have yeah. to be vigilant. So I showed Ryan the email. I was like, look, we got a, a, you know, someone flaming Dusty and Ryan read, he's like, ah, the whole store thing's a mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, like, ah, just... <laughs> owning stores is a mess. It's hard, whatever. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, the key was, Will, and I think this is a key in business in every way is people have to adapt. Yeah. And, and overcome. I mean, you know, I get, I go to a lot of things. Ron's the same way. I mean, we're extremely well known in an industry where neither one of us pretends or has any delusions of what we look like. We're the best version of ourself and, and you're doing much better financially. And to be honest with you, I would not trade with the majority, unless you're talking about the top five in the world, I don't want to trade. Because for me, this bodybuilding has always been a business for me. I love it, but it's a business. And I've had fans say that before, like, I don't even know why you keep trying. You're never going to win a show. And I laugh. I'm like, okay, the average show is $10,000 to the winner. They don't have a sponsor. So they're going to spend eight getting ready, you know, between their coaches and their flights and their food and all the things. I'm like, so they won two grand. Make more than that in a week. Like, why on earth is that winning? I'm winning, you know, so that's always my argument. I'm like, I win every day yeah. and, and none of my sponsors, if I never compete again, my sponsor won't care. Now, the next part uh, to this question is like about social media. Now I'm starting this new show with my friend, Sam, who is an IFBB pro. She did uh, bikini and we're trying to like shine a light on people that aren't talked about enough, like men's physique and all the women's categories and just like show more people about this. But it's kind of crazy to see that all these people like don't have YouTube channels and they're not like posting on YouTube or whatever. But what do you guys think? Do you think that that is a bad decision on their part? Like, do you think you need a YouTube channel in this day and age? Well, I, I don't think you need a YouTube channel. I think you need something that you like to use that you've, you're comfortable and able to you know put your stuff out on you know what i mean like i i happen to like instagram the best um facebook for me is not that interesting i barely check it i just push my instagram to my facebook yeah. i don't use twitter you know some people depending on the line of work they're in twitter is their thing right um yeah. you have to have something i i don't think you need a youtube channel but if if videos are your thing then you know, there's no, there's no such thing as too late to start. You know, I think yeah. some people are maybe getting overwhelmed. Like they're starting out in this and maybe they went and competed a few times and, and they never even thought of a channel. I remember just telling them to start a YouTube channel and it's like, Oh, uh, you know, it's like a little bit much for some people. Um, I was never kind of good at YouTube. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I never really did that. It was more Dusty's thing. Um, so I don't think you need a YouTube channel, but I mean, if you, I also, I also must say, I admire the people who just train and compete <laughs> and, and don't put it on anything and don't feel like it's part of their thing. And they just keep it totally separate for themselves as their hobby. That's awesome too. So, uh, but if you're looking to get something out of it, like you're looking to, 
make a buck or promote yourself or get a sponsor, then you have to have something that you're consistently mm -hmm. good at uh, for social media. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Ron nailed it. Is the key is this, you, you, what you just said, Will is, is the, is the biggest point. You can't hide in your house. It, it's kind of like somebody who's single saying, man, I can't find anybody in this world. And it's like, you don't go out. You don't yeah. meet people. You don't do anything. Are you expecting the love of your life to knock on your front door and be like, hey, I've been looking for you. And also too, like how many dating apps are there? Maybe you got to find the right dating app for you. You know, yeah. like. <laughs> that, that's it's accurate. It's actually a great comparison because that's that's what it is, is you have to have a way that people can find you. And I think the other thing is like, you're a prime example. Look what you're building. YouTube is actually an impossible forum right now because it's not at all, um, nothing just happens. It's not organic anymore. Yeah. Like I, I struggle now to build a YouTube, even with my following, because it's a, it's not an organic place anymore. If you wanted to build, like if someone came to me and said, Hey, I do everything. I can do any platform there is. I'd be like, okay, TikTok is for you then. It's the fastest way to grow a following there is. I don't even do it. Yeah. But if I was trying to teach someone, that is still 100% organic. If I started one and really put effort into it, I would surpass my Instagram following in probably six months, um, which is something I really need to do. But I actually have to study on how to use that platform properly. But the thing is this, is you do need to find a way to get out there because Ron and I are actually a prime example. And I, I've heard people say this to Ron, and I've had him say it to me. Two things that you love to hear. Number one, you're bigger than I thought. Number two is you're just like you are on social media. Yeah. Uh, because people feel like they already know you. I mean, I will have people walk up, and they're like, Dusty, what's up? And it's, it's so true. I'm like, fuck, am I supposed to know this guy? So I'm like, hey. And they're like, oh, you don't know me. And I'm like, oh, shit, thank God. You scared the hell out of me. <laughs> like, but they know you. You know, it's a big thing. It's something I remember from following Jay is I remember the things I liked about his videos. I don't want to watch someone train. I think it's boring as hell. But I remember I knew his wife. I knew his dogs. I knew his cars. I knew his house. I was like, I know this guy. And then when I became friends with Jay, he's exactly who I thought he was. I, I remember emailing with Jay Cutler uh, back when in like 2000, yeah. 2001, asking advice. And the funniest thing is I remember his email said, hey, bro. Yeah, just like now. And just then like when you talks. actually meet Jay, he's like, hey, bro. <laughs> and I remember making that connection the first time I met him, which was like 2002. I remember like, oh, he, he he's actually just speaking in his email. They can yeah. hear his voice. You know, <laughs> hey, bro. Yeah, you're going to need more carbs. Like you can just hear him. <laughs> well, that's kind of how I feel with you guys. I feel like I before... Before we started this, I was like, these guys are like my best friends. I've been watching these guys forever. And then I'm like, oh, wait, we've never talked before. Oh, my goodness. I hope <laughs> we're that, not polluting your young mind. We're, it's all good, Ron. It's all good. No, but that's the idea. And look at you. I mean, that's what's happening with you. People are having an angle and getting to know you. Like, I think it's genius that you make it clear what you're into besides bodybuilding. Because there's, there is so much going on with him. I mean, look, people identify with Ron. I remember when he first started putting up the, uh, the BMX stuff, I was asking him off the air, what's going on with that? What are we doing? You know what I mean? He sends me clips every now and then when I bug him to send me new, uh, because he doesn't want to hammer his bodybuilding community with, with BMX shit. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I think people un underestimate that they're interested because there's guys that are into bodybuilding who are into comics or into BMX or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm always stunned um, in fact, I think I told you about this, Ron. I was going into Starbucks just a couple of months ago, and this guy was kind of like limping. He was an older guy. So I waited and held the door. And then he came in, and then I stepped in. I was waiting for a, uh, I was waiting for a mobile order, and he looked at me and goes, so are you getting a Dusty special? And I'm like, what? Like, I was stunned that he knew me. He didn't even look like he worked out. You know? Yeah, I mean, he knew exactly what my order was. And I was that's the thing about the social media and it's same thing when I first started selling t-shirts back in the day, I bought a bunch of two and three and four X shirts. And the first orders that came through were for mediums. And I was like, shit, I don't even have a medium. Like your following isn't what you think it is. And I started thinking back, I'm like, I don't own any bodybuilder shirts. Yeah. So that makes sense. So the four X guys are rarely buying them. 
<laughs> yeah. And another thing uh, to continue on with what Dusty just said, um, I want to encourage you, Will, to to like hammer your other interests to people as well, because mm -hmm. I, I I'm I'm still uh, in sh in shock often with the messages I'm getting like this week alone, I got two guys in their 40s that have been training for years and they're like, I'm fucking building a bike. Cause I used to ride and I love the movie rad and fuck it. I got spare time. There's a skate park by my house, whatever, yeah. you know, my kids yeah. are, my kids gone to college. I got fucking, I got a bit of money and time on my hands. Fuck it. You know, like, and, and, and I'm like, Holy shit. Like people are like getting off their ass and doing something they always love to do because I've been putting up posts and it, it's like pretty crazy feeling. And at first I was hesitant. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't want the bodybuilding fans to be like, what's this fucking annoying. You know what I mean? But I'm like, wait a minute. This is me. This is my fucking channel. Yeah. Like if I want to talk about ACDC for an hour on an IGTV video, I can do that and fuck everyone who doesn't like it. They can unfollow me. Yeah. Like, and, and that's, I think if, if like I've been, you know, I'm learning that at an old age, whereas you can just yeah. hammer that all the way through. Yeah, you see, like James Hollings said with his like whole video games that he likes yes. to do. And let me ask you a question: like before you came on the show, did you know that I like comic books and I did a show every week live about talking about comic books? I did not know that you did a show about comic books, but I I did know that you liked comic books. You know, I'd like I'd seen your show before and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, my answer is the same. I I knew, I knew that, but I didn't realize there was a show also. Yeah, yeah. We do a show every Friday live, and I see bodybuilders in the chat saying I, I got into comic books because of you and now i'm reading comic books and i now pick up these books that you're talking about so i know what you're talking about i'm like that's freaky freaking awesome yeah, yeah it is awesome and 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 you can like you can explode that whole side of your if you're doing another show that's awesome how many shows do you have is it two <laughs> well we used to do uh six shows a week but now we do just these two so six wow. shows a week yeah we do one like every day so it, Dad, do you not work? <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah. But so show us, show us your favorite. So of the stuff that's in the shot there, what's the, what's your like to you? What's the most valuable figure or item on that shelf? If there's a house fire and your dad says, "Grab one thing." Uh oh, he knows exactly. He, he went right going. to it. He what is this? Oh, it's something signed. So this I is bet. Amazing Spider-Man number 300. And this is the very first appearance of Venom in comic books. Oh, wow. The black suit, right? Yep. Is that the one? Doesn't he find that suit on the moon or something? Well, it was kind of like an alien that came to Earth. But okay, if, okay. if this thing was in like mint condition, it's like, like it, it, out of 10, this is probably like a three. So if it was like near like the 10, it would be close to like $3,000. So, so that's, that's when he gets the black Spidey suit, right? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. See, that's I know that much awesome. about Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, but that one was actually gifted to me. So someone sent it to me in the mail and I was not expecting that at all. No we way. If you get that built up enough, uh, my video guy, Todd, his son is into WWE. Yeah. So he started doing, he has a channel for WWE stuff. It's uh, WWE Fan Talk Live or something like that. Um, but he has over a hundred thousand subscribers now, and these companies send him toys and the belts to review awesome. on the show. So he literally has thousands and thousands of dollars in these in these replica belts and things that are given to him just to do reviews. Yeah, that, that that's crazy. I that's... I have like I have seventeen boxes of comic books that are in my room. So my room is a bed in comic book boxes. Chicks <laughs> dig that. Yeah. It's, it's, ask, yeah. My nerd room. <laughs> hey, asking him. I think Luke had a nerd room like that too. So you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, man. Don't. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I'm excited for you. And uh, you know the, the 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 kids at school. I remember you 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 mentioned a few times that some of the kids at school used to like kind of give you a hard time and stuff like that. And uh, just remember, you'll be laughing. You'll be laughing in 10 years. Quite often the high school reunion doesn't go as good for some of those guys. <laughs> that is a fact. So yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, I, 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 uh, 
I, I bet that as things keep rolling, I mean, you're already getting the bodybuilding guests on. I mean, you're going to have a Mr. Olympia on your show, another Mr. Olympia on your show in no time, I bet. Um, but what about the comic book stuff? Do yeah, you that, have like... When I first started my interviews, I only did comic book people. I interviewed artists, writers, and actually next week I'm doing... Uh, I'm interviewing a artist that works with Keanu Reeves. Oh, amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. How did you, so how did you get, let me ask you this. Now, now we're stealing your interview because that's how we're wrong. I roll. How did you get into the bodybuilding side? Like how'd you get on food? I'd show to begin with. Like, isn't that how the did first I get like, into, like, breakthrough? Stuff? No, like how did you get to the point? I mean, there's a lot of kids that are, I mean, heck, kids, there's a lot of adults that would like to know how the hell you got Bumstead and Fuad and all these guys on your show. I mean, how'd you get that rolling? Man, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll do it in parts. So I got into like lifting and stuff from wrestling. I started wrestling five years ago and I didn't, and, and jujitsu, and I didn't like have any like muscle or anything. So I was like, I got to go to the gym and start doing stuff. So I went to this like crappy gym and they had like a couple squat racks and they had a couple dumbbells. And I'd go there, and after we went there, I went to this real gym that I'm at. I've been at this gym for five years now, and this place has, like, everything. Uh, Ron, you should come here. Dusty, you should come here. You and on a mission. Let's go. Love to. Uh, but, like, I've been here, and I did, like, I started with powerlifting and powerlifting before bodybuilding. So I did all that stuff, and I set a bunch of uh state records and i set two uh american records and i have 19 state records so i all that was from like just training hard staying Is the things that i've done in mind that's terrible go ahead <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've beaten me in life already okay moving forward <laughs> but i was 13 i weighed 84 pounds and i set the american record deadlifting 225 so that's three times my three body times weight. Three times your body weight. Shit. I cannot do three times my body weight. You yeah. win. You're already yeah. stronger than me pound for pound. How about that? You can you can put that in your well, quote I can't for pull life. But with yeah, these I interviews, I think it's just from hard work because I would just constantly just keep working. Like I would just send people messages like once a week. Be like, you want to call my show? I do interviews and stuff like that. And I just do that. They didn't respond. I do it again the next week. And just doing that. With yes. Uad, I just sent him an email. Nothing the first time. I sent him another one. He's like, all right, let's do it. But I think the one guy that I'm doing <laughs> a lot to is James Hollingshead. I sent, I think I sent him like eight messages already asking him to come on. And I'll he follows him. me and stuff. I went on Uad's <laughs> podcast with him. And he's like, Oh, yes, mate. I'm going to come on your show. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So I, he's like, send me a message. I, I sent him a message. He's like, nothing, nothing. So, uh, you know what it is we'll sometimes with the messages? They're, it, you, one thing I think that sucks, and, I, and I've had to learn how to manage it, is when you get, and this sounds terrible, but when you get as many messages as you do, if I ever make the mistake of opening it something and I can't respond in that moment, maybe I can't answer your question and I forget, I am screwed. Yeah, I because try to mark so many red, messages. They up. will fall down like a hundred. And in your case, he knows you, so you're a little bit clearer. But I've had a few where I've had to spend like 30 minutes combing for something. I told someone I would do and I didn't remember who they were. Like I was gonna send them a link to something. I was like, oh shit. That guy sent that like three days ago. This is 87 messages down somewhere, and I have no idea who he is. You'll get him on. I saw your post the other day. It was hilarious. Him yeah. laying back. I'm just going to, I'm going to post for James and be like, Hey, so yeah. we're, just, we're just lying to Will now. Is that what we're doing? Oh, I got to do a story. <laughs> I got to make sure I do a story that we're, uh, that we're on the air. eh? there you go. You know do, what I mean? We're just doing Let's a story a right photo. now. Of all your, there you go. Throwing up the gun. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I know that the two of you are really great on the mic. You have a podcast that you do together called It's Just Bodybuilding. I always laugh at Ron because his mouth is always just hanging open when he's looking at the camera. And I'm always dying laughing <laughs> because I just see him go. <laughs> <laughs> he's, that's because he's amazed that I just said something that dumb again. I'm always sitting there going, Dusty's still alive? <laughs> and we're both amazed people are listening, okay? But, but yes. my question is to you, what uh, – who is like your dream guest that you want to come on that you want to have on your show? Like Dusty, who's the number one person that you want on? And Ron, same for you. Joe Rogan. <laughs> you know what's funny is I, I actually, all kidding aside, I would like to for us to. We may not do it on. It's just bodybuilding, but I think we may because we're getting enough fanfare now. Is 
I would love to bring in because we we ended up talking about a lot of things that aren't bodybuilding. I would love to have someone that's outside the bodybuilding world that's very successful on just because how they became successful is a mirror story of bodybuilding. I guarantee yeah, it. I, I can't wait until you get the porn stars on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, we're, we're making this happen. If Will asks for uh, it. I'm trying to steer my things. life in a different direction, Dusty. <laughs> you can't disappoint Willie. He was, we begged him to be on his show. He finally caved and let us on whole, this thing. whole generation of young people we have to, to, to <laughs> uh, you know, contribute to. Um, uh, yeah, well, hey, Rogan, that's a top guest. I mean, you have Rogan on your show. It's like yeah. having the most powerful man in media on your show. Um, but as far as bodybuilding guests, um, you know, I, it's, I've been very fortunate and I've already gotten to interview like Kevin LeVrone, Dorian Yates, you know, people like this, I already interviewed them on my old mutant show. Uh, but I would, I would love to get Dorian on again, which I think I can do. I actually messaged Dino the other day about whether we could get Dawes on for an episode. So he might be able to make that happen. But um, I actually really want to get Lee Labrada on. Oh, that and, would be good. And uh, Hunter's, Hunter's mentioned it to his dad a few times. So you know how some of the guys are. They're not quite. They're like, oh, I don't know, you know, the older guys, right? So he said his dad's not really into the technology, but uh, he's mentioned it to him. And uh, I would really love to get Lee on because Lee was the first pro I ever met. And it would yeah, kind of right. come full circle for me if we could have Lee on, you know. Yeah, I'm trying so, to get Hunter to come on this show, but it's hard to get him to notice. But I think mean, they're scared of your questions. They're not sure where you're going to yeah. lock them in. One Maybe second, not. stay right there. We're we're. Uh, but we're my my dream message. guests that I want on the show are not uh, uh, bodybuilding related. My mine are Dave Batista and CM Punk. Those were my two like idols. Oh, uh, Batista'd be great. That's a great pick. Cause like I would love to ask him about some of the movies he shot. Yeah, you know he was in that Blade Runner movie and obviously Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy, and he's done some cool shit. So that's a good pick, you know. Yeah. And like, I know they both do jujitsu, and I can ask CM Punk about being in UFC and doing that. I'd love like, to. Have, I'd love to interview John Cena as well. You know, he used to be yeah. a bodybuilder. That whole tie-in, right? He's actually still a bodybuilder. I yeah, trained, he's still a bodybuilder in San Diego a couple times at what used to be called World's Gym. That dude yep. trains like he's broke. He's bodybuilding. Yeah, that's it's what I've always heard about him. Everyone he, says that about him. He actually went to school uh, not too far from where we are. So he went to Springfield just, College. So that's that's only like... Well, probably. call him up for us and get him on our show. All right. yeah, you can hit him on the... I just text I just text Hunter for you. You owe us some John Cena. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. We get you Hunter. You get us John Cena. How's that? All right, <laughs> it's even trade. It's the same. Okay. Let's rapid fire. All right. Uh, would you rather speak to animals or speak every human language? Animals. I hate humans. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a that's a really cool question. Just wait to the next one. <laughs> so, so here's my take: speaking to animals would be uh, I I can't even imagine the, uh, the I just talk to dogs all day. That's exactly. what I do. But uh, I can't ignore the financial repercussions of speaking Mandarin and Russian. You don't and... think there'd be some financial repercussions to be able to talk to someone's dog for them? Okay, okay. Listen, okay, yeah, Sally. Yeah, you start a new business, yeah. <laughs> I'm the dog whisperer. Yeah, literally. Yeah, I just asked like your her. dog why he's pissing on the carpet. And he says that he hates your car. I mean, yeah. there you go. <laughs> the color of your car has to change. <laughs> All right, so this next one, well, these are these were all from Instagram uh, people, but this next one is the one that I want to ask you guys. So I came up with this one. What superheroes would win the Olympia for each category in Open, 212, Classic, and Men's Physique? <laughs> wow. Well, um, let's say the Open, hmm, is it Hulk? I would think it would be Hulk, right? Hulk would be the Open. Yeah. He's like a Green Branch Warren. Valid with there hair. There you go. There. <laughs> um, I'd say maybe Captain America wins men's physique. But is, is Captain America more so? Would that mean that then Superman is classic? Well, Superman I, is I, I said, kind of Superman. I like I had, uh, I'll just tell you mine. I had, uh, I had Bane for open, I had Wolverine for 212. 
I had <laughs> Batman for classic and I had Spider Man for physique. So I was close. Yeah, I was bad. close. Yeah, because I had Spider Man for physique in my head too. Yeah, yeah. Just because that whole Femi outfit he wears. Um, <laughs> whoa, was that loud? My bad. I could just I could see him with the little pose, you know. Right. So, right. That makes sense. I like that. With that. That's good. Good. I like your list. I do. It's solid. But I'm trying to think. My only issue is, is the 212 because I feel like, you know, Wolverine's a little tall, but that's fine. The same <laughs> if there's a shorter superhero that could be 212. Is there a, is there a Sean Clarita sized superhero? Well, Wolverine's 5'1. Oh, is he? he? Is. I didn't know that. In the comic books. Ah. Well, that's the accurate one. Then I think they should get rid of old what's his name that's the yeah. Wolverine in the shows. It's really. I thought he was tall because of that. Fun Damn, form. look like, at Will dropping Jackman knowledge. Like six She's foot a, something. Changing my worldview. <laughs> I had no idea. I'm, like, now I'm just angry that they had Hugh Jackman. When they could have just. Now I'm mad guys. about Hugh Jackman. I'm still impressed that he trains so hard and can deadlift heavy, but he's not Wolverine. So Jose should have been Wolverine. Well, yeah, there you go. Jose, Jose would be Wolverine. There you go. <laughs> All right. Okay. What's, your, what's your next one, Will? All right. This one's. Uh, this one's. To- geared towards uh, Dusty. Oh Would you rather only eat off uh, square plates or never wear chucks again? Or never, never, sorry, I said it wrong. Would you rather never eat off of square plates or never wear chucks again? So you have to give up one of your anabolic secrets. One of your anabolic, one of the, one of the, the facets of your massive anabolism has to be removed. Okay, this is going to shock you, Will. I'm keeping my square plates, and I'm going to trust in Lee Labrada and Charity Witt that I can switch over to Vans because they're still flat Ooh, shoes. Right. See, Vans are like the cool thing for young people, and I'm not cool or young. But You could also do Adidas Superstars. See? Right? Yeah, they're so they're I've got, got options. The shell toe, got the shell I have toe. a real issue with the circle plates. I mean, the visual, when I take a picture, I mean, I might as well be paper at that point. It's shit. Yeah, you just use paper plates. I, I had a, I posted a picture on Instagram, and it was, I had a steak and potatoes and whatever, and it was on a circle plate, and everyone was like, where the hell is the square plate? And I tagged you, Justine, and I don't even think you liked it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't see it, but yeah, see, that they're very accurate, because that would have ruined, that would, your whole, listen, you'd be up at least three pounds right now if you're eating off square plates. Okay. Makes so, a difference. Yeah. Um, the uh, next one is, would you rather have everyone know what you're thinking all the time or have your life live, live streamed all the time so people can see everything you're doing? So uh, see so everything I'm doing versus about, thinking. Is there a way I can opt out of both? I don't oh, want wow. them to see what I'm doing because when I'm the dark, dark. <laughs> I think this- I oh, think I think I'd rather they see what I'm doing than see what see? I'm thinking. I'm on page, you don't want people to see what you're thinking no Especially me. that's Maybe. too much Some people can see what i'm looking at my face if they could actually yeah i'm already fix. giving away too much <laughs> <laughs> that's why dusty walks around with a smile all day that's right i'm always laughing that way you don't know what i'm actually thinking the laugh could be like hey that's amazing or hey you're an idiot they're both <laughs> right all right so i got two more uh Marcus goes to the store. He buys 50 sneaker, Snickers, and he eats 40 of them. What does Marcus have now? Diabetes. Yay! <laughs> you got it. <laughs> there it is. Nice. I can't two. believe we both answered exactly the same time. <laughs> like we knew, but we didn't. <laughs> right. We promised that was not one. scripted. This last one is, what is the creepiest thing you could say to a stranger on the street? I like your underwear. You should make your bed when you wake up in the morning. Oh, there you go. (laughs) The fact that I know that's creepy. That'd be creepy. Ron, I I really did want to talk with you about Mutant on a Mission, but I know that you guys are on a tight schedule, but... I know we're wrapping it up right here, but this last question I'm going to ask you guys is this one question that I ask all my guests, and it's geared towards people who are like me, who aren't like the most popular kid in school, people who used to, who people who sit alone at lunch and aren't going through the best things right now. 
but they want to go out and do something with their lives, go out and do something great. What advice can you give these people to go out and just go do what they want? I would say that you have to um, stay focused on the fact that none of this, none of what you're going through right now actually matters. And what I mean, sitting alone at lunch and all that stuff, it's no reflection to you as a person. It's, it's, it's the crazy teenage nonsense that's going on in everybody else's head. And high school, when you look back on high school as an adult, it just, it, it's crazy how silly it, it is, all that stuff. And later in life, you're going to become really good friends with some of the people that wouldn't talk to you. And you're going to not talk to some of the people that did talk to you. And you're going to have people apologize to you for being a dick. And it's really weird what happens after high school. And it, it uh, you just have to s- stay focused on the things that make you happy. And friends will find you. And the right people will appreciate what you're doing. And you have a whole world open to you with your channels and with what you're doing. And you're bigger than your high school. And uh, there's going to be people that are jealous about that. You know, how come this guy's got this attention and I don't? And it's going to be kind of weird. It's a weird place for everybody. And um, I'm very fortunate I had a good high school experience, but I appreciate people who didn't. And uh, yeah, just stick it out because you're going to look back on it and laugh. It's not even going to matter. It's funny that you say that because I just had my first ever troll in my Chris Bumstead interview. Nice. Uh, The guy commented on the video. He says, I... What's the deal with this kid? How does he interview these people? Is he a make a wish kid? You know what's great about that, though? I mean, truthfully, and it, I'm sure you've spent enough time watching all of our stuff. Like, that is perfect because that's an example that, that shows you what's going on in his life, not in yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Negativity it's all a reflection from, on from other people. We get it all the time. Sometimes I'll take the time, and, and I like to say I like to play with the trolls um, when I'm bored. But at the end of the day, I don't actually think about them. And it's, it should be the same thing with your with your school life and everything else. Yeah. When you it's it's tricky because when you get to somewhere like where we are, it becomes very, very cool to be an individual and do whatever the hell you want. The key is do it now. Like you should do what makes you happy all the time and, and the things that are as long as it's not hurting anybody else, because that is your path and it'll lead you where you're supposed to be. You know, it's funny, but I remember when I was a kid, people would say, oh, you can't be wasting time on those stupid video games. It's never going to go anywhere. Or I know like uh, Tony Hawk's a prime example. He's obviously well before you, but you know who he is. His teachers used to tell him, listen, you're going to be a loser your entire life. You got to stop wasting your time with skateboarding and get focused. And meanwhile, he was making more money than his teachers then. He's like, yeah. Okay. And same thing. I mean, some of the biggest people you would know, I don't know if you know who he is, but you should follow him for sure. Is like Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a prime example of a guy who was literally called a loser by his friend's parents yeah. because he didn't fit the mold of what you were supposed to do. Yeah. You know, and I saw a thing by him. It was so funny because they, they would hammer away on him like, Oh, you're never going to be anything. You're a loser. And I remember one interview, he, It was, I loved it. And some people see it as arrogant, but I loved it. He goes, I make more than my entire graduating class does. All of them combined. (laughs) Put together times 10. You know, so it's like, that's how you want to look at stuff though, is, is remember how many people have been in your shoes. And on the other foot, those who are the coolest, greatest thing right now, who knows, you know, the bottom line is you worry about staying in your lane and same with all kids and even adults, like, do your thing and don't let anybody else affect you because I mean, hell, I know definitely for me, I can't speak for Ron, but I would have quit bodybuilding as soon as I started. If I listened to what people told me, I oh, people yeah. literally laugh when I told them, Oh, I'm going to make a career out of this. But I did have a few, a few of them that are now literally friends of mine. I was an adult. I was in my twenties come back to me when I made it. And they're like, man, I have to tell you, I, I thought you were a joke when you were going for this. And now I'm like, Holy shit. Yeah. You know? I, I had someone that I've known for a long time say to me a little while ago, they're like, you know, I always thought that you were going to regret all of this. And they were like, but like, fuck, your gym looks awesome. And it looks like you're having a great time and everything looks like it's going well. And, you know, it's just funny what people 
it, what other people think, it just doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. And uh, you just keep doing what you're doing. And, and if you think of something and you think it's going to be fun, do it. I think I'm going to do a sh- What if I did a show on this? Just do it. Like, you know, uh, when you get older, man, no one will remember. And I can say this from experience. Yeah. I have to tell people about failures. Yeah. Like I've had people, because people so give me credit for stuff oh, I didn't do. Yeah. Or I've had people say, oh, man, everything you've ever done is huge. I'm like, oh, I lost $200,000 one year. They're yeah. like, what? I'm like, yeah, I missed. I had a really yeah. bad business decision that cost me more than most people make and almost bankrupted me at one point in my life. It's like people don't even remember that stuff in hindsight. So no. trust me, in, in a few years when whatever it is you're doing, it might be this, it might be something else, but none of this matters. I highly doubt that Elon Musk was the popular kid. I can promise you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he's doing okay now. Yeah, I think he's doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But, awesome, man. All right, guys, this was absolutely awesome. I had so much fun hearing your story and hearing everything about everything. I just had so much fun. I want to thank you guys for doing this. I hope you guys had fun. Did you have fun? It was awesome. I, I had a blast. I really love the Caballero board behind you there. I've been staring at that the whole time. That's 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 good shit. It's signed too. Oh no way. Steve Caballero signed that. Are you kidding? <laughs> That's fucking awesome. It was the very last board and he signed it. No way. That's that's awesome. I would just yeah, I would hang that on my wall. You know, like you're you you you're doing so many awesome things. I'm really excited for you. I wish I was what are you, 15? Yep. I wish I was 15 again, man. And knowing then what I know now, <laughs> damn. But yeah, what Dusty said, no one's gonna remember any of the fails. So just yeah. keep failing over and over and over and take my- the wins. <laughs> I just want to bring that skateboard back up. Uh, my dad got that for the same exact price, $75. So. Oh, man. That's awesome. <laughs> now he's sneaking into the things that I love. It's, it's, yeah. al- it's always cooler when you get a deal. <laughs> I, hope I, am, I hope I impress somebody with my ability to pick that Caballero out behind your arm there because you've got to have an eye for that. Yeah, I would have <laughs> done that for sure. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you guys again for doing this. Uh, yeah, it just blows my mind that I was able to sit down with you guys. I, I, I've been watching you guys for a while now, and it's crazy that. Well, stuff. hey, uh, you know, you already blew through the A-listers, so I assumed you are going to move on to the B-listers eventually. <laughs> and, and And we're here, <laughs> and we made it, you know? Uh, so uh, we, we hope that uh, people like the episode well. Well, we just wanted to say with uh, Mutant on the Mission, uh, we'll watch practically all of them. Oh, okay. He really wanted to talk about it, but when Dusty said that uh, he had to be short, he took out all the questions for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I saw when you did the Dallas one, you were doing like the barbecue stuff. On your other mutant uh, on a missions, did you ever like uh, have the chance or think about putting like uh, places to eat? you know, in with the episodes. Yeah. So that episode got really crazy long because they organized this whole day for us. Like we were just going to the gym, but then they were like, Oh my God, this is going to be awesome. We're going to plan some stuff for you. And they planned the shooting and the barbecue and they wanted it to be like a Dallas feel. And our camera guy at the time, the guy that shot for us, he knows them really well. So it was all cool. Cause we were all friends. So that was like an extra long, like we shot all day for that episode. Like oh. we started at like, we were at the range at like 10 in the morning and we didn't train until like nine 30 at night. So we shot like a 12 hour day Oh wow, yeah. and it was, it was crazy. And most of the other episodes, we just didn't have that sort of time. Like I'm yeah. arriving at the gym at nine 30 AM and we're, we're on our way to the airport by two 30. Oh wow. So it's like into the gym tour, train, shower, stuff a meal yeah. down my throat, Uber to the airport gone. Like, in and out really, really fast. Cause most of the mutant on emissions are shot two episodes at a time on yeah. a three day trip. Oh, wow. So it's like into a city, stay overnight, shoot the next morning, fly to another city, stay overnight, shoot the next morning, fly home. Yeah. So they're just bang, bang, bang. So they're all really, really fast except for the odd one. And Dallas was one of the ones where they had like time to do that. Yeah. I, I, you know, it took forever, but I thought that was probably probably the best well-rounded episode because yeah, of that, it, you know the shooting and all that kind of stuff in there as well. And I'm like, 
I'm like, this is totally what Anthony Bourdain does. And I'm like, if this is in the weightlifting world and this is, you know, absolutely awesome what you got going on. Yeah, I appreciate that. That was a fun one. I, I, I still talk to Greg all the time. The guy that I trained with in that, I still talk to Greg. He's a good friend of mine. So, yeah. and the whole Dallas crew, they're great people. Yeah. There you have it, everyone. Another episode of Becoming Stronger with the Beast in the books. I hope you all enjoyed this video. I had so much fun sitting down with Dusty and Ron. They are great, genuine people, and they are truly one of a kind. I loved hearing their stories, hearing what they went through, and what they are doing here today. Dusty, Ron, if you're watching this, thank you so much for doing this again. It really means a lot to me, and I just still can't believe that I had this opportunity. I hope you all enjoyed watching this interview. Before you all leave, just hit the subscribe, hit the like, and hit the notification bell. And I'll catch you in the next episode of Becoming Stronger with the Beast. And before I go, I'm reminding you of my new show that's coming out. I talked about it last week after the Chris Bumstead interview, but I'm starting a new show with my friend Sammy Renee, who is an IFBB pro who does bikini. And we're starting a show, and we're going to start spotlighting people that aren't talked about enough, like classic, classic men's physique and all the women's categories. I can't wait to start that show. I know it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you're all ready, because here at Hero and the Kid, we got a lot of stuff in store for all of you, and I hope you're ready for the ride.